Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in to the nightly news this Monday night Labor Day special. I hope that everybody is enjoying their time off. I hope that everybody is enjoying their Labor Day. And while we enjoy the cold beverages and the juicy meats and the juicy vegetables and the smell of charcoal and barbecue, maybe you're out on the lake boating with friends and family, let's just remember how important America is, how important freedom is, how important liberty is. And that's what we here at InfoWars are striving to protect. You can't have liberty without vigilance. So even though we take time off on this Labor Day to enjoy the privileges and freedoms of being an American, let's also recall that it takes vigilance of our leaders in order to ensure that freedom. And that's why InfoWars.com is committed to the fight for liberty. This is the Labor Day Nightly News Special. So Colin Kaepernick again has decided he's going to sit during the national anthem. And this was even more selfish, more arrogant than the first time because he chose to do this on military night. He couldn't put his own political agendas aside for the military. That is selfishness, folks. That is selfishness, at least in my opinion. So let's try to figure out exactly what's going on with Colin Kaepernick. Let's try to tie it into some history. And let's try to maybe even extend an offer to Colin Kaepernick to maybe voice some of his opinions on the show. But first, let's try to figure out what's going on and maybe even inform Colin. So first of all, it's interesting to note that Colin Kaepernick, as many people know by now, converted to the religion of Islam in the off season. Now, he's also engaged to a well-known Black Lives Matter activist who is DJ Nessa Diab on Hot 97. Now, she's been very vocal about her support of Black Lives Matter. And when I was looking into her, I found her logo to be very, very suspicious, folks. You might want to check out uh, the logo. There's the, oh, there it is, the nice little Illuminati period. Oh, pyramid, look at that. Oh, so there's the official logo for Colin Kaepernick's fiance's radio show, an Illuminati pyramid. So what do you think about that? I wonder if Colin Kaepernick has any idea about that. Colin Kaepernick has now been joined by other NFL players, such as teammate Eric Reed and the Seattle Seahawks' Jeremy Lane. And, and he's doing this in the face of a lot of rejection. He was booed in San Diego. There were a lot of jeers. When he walked into the clubhouse, he got booed and shouted out. But it does appear that he does have the support of his teammates and other people around the league. Now, Colin Kaepernick says that he's not anti-American and that he loves America and he wants to help make America better. I'm not sure if he's going about this the right way. I'm not sure how the divide and conquer tactic that Colin Kaepernick is using is going about helping America in the right way. I think that this creates the divide between police and citizens. And that's exactly what people like George Soros want. But we'll get into that in a matter of time. But wearing socks with a pig in a cop hat doesn't help America. And I thought if I was the owner or coach of the 49ers, as soon as I saw or, or an NFL exec, as soon as I saw Colin, Ka Ka Colin Kaepernick do this, I would have cut him immediately. I would have wanted nothing to do with that player anymore. That cannot be good for a clubhouse. That cannot be good for America. And it's interesting, a story out of the Daily Mail says that some NFL execs are not happy with Colin Kaepernick. And there's even rumors that he might be done playing professional football. I don't know if that's true or not. He did play last night and he actually played pretty well something he was concerned about. Now, he did say he's going to donate $1 million to causes of issues that he sees being put in the spotlight, such as racial inequality and police brutality. So I wonder if that $1 million is going to go to Black Lives Matter, the NAACP, some other form, maybe even, how about this, maybe a police organization, maybe towards the families of the victims 
of the Dallas police shooting. So let's see where Colin Kaepernick gives his $1 million. Boy, what, what an oppressed human being that can just give away a $1 million. Must be tough to be Colin Kaepernick. Now, Colin has said that this is all a misunderstanding, that his points are being misconstrued. And I think that Colin Kaepernick is the one that is confused in this issue. But hey, maybe we aren't understanding Colin Kaepernick. Maybe he needs to come on Infowars.com and do an interview. You know what, let's actually get into this angle. You know, Colin Kaepernick is not the first player to do this on a national stage, on a professional athlete stage. Before Colin Kaepernick did it, an NBA player did the same thing. His name was Abdul Rauf, um, and he was converted to Islam just before he did his protest as well. So that's an interesting angle that they convert to Islam and then they want to protest the national anthem and the American flag. Boy, we should bring more of these people to this country, shouldn't we? People that want to protest the flag. What do you think that's going to do to America, Colin? You say you want to help America, but how do you think that's going to help America when people convert to Islam, they don't want to honor the flag or the national anthem, and then we're going to bring these people in by the millions? That's not going to help America. But it's a different reception that was received in 96 while Rauf's career was ended, folks. His career was ended. He could never play the same again. The media criticized him. He was suspended from the NBA for his protest. And, and of course, you know, he's so, he's so vindicated in his religious beliefs, they took away his paycheck, and all of a sudden his protest stopped. So that's how vindicated he was in his beliefs. Of course, he still says uh, that he's glad he did it uh, to this day. But he lost his paycheck. He lost his career. He was demonized in the media. People completely rejected his protest. But now, in the modern day of the liberal media running uh, our train of thought, it's okay. He doesn't get suspended, and he gets basically endorsed by the NFL, folks. I'm telling you this. This was shocking. I'm watching this game, and the coverage on CBS and the coverage on the NFL networks were totally pro-Kaepernick. They endorsed him the whole time. They gave him more camera time and more recognition than any of the veterans that were in Qualcomm Stadium, more than the chief petty officer that sang the national anthem. CBS didn't even mention the chief petty officer's name. I had to listen to the PA, try to hear the PA over the broadcasters, just to find out who this chief petty officer was. No respect for the military, no regard for the vets. It's all about Colin Kaepernick's protest on CBS and NFL. That's disgusting. Now, here are some comments that Stephen A. Smith has made regarding the matter but in this particular instance he really would have to be black to understand and more importantly he would need to be black to really make the kind of statement that he made so stephen a smith in my opinion illustrates the double standard in this society where stephen a smith says that a white man can't hold an opinion on a black man's perspective. But then it's okay for Stephen A. Smith as a black man to assume he understands what it's like as a white man. So that is a complete double standard coming from that point of view, completely bogus. And at the end of the day, it's just a divide and conquer tactic anyway. But ESPN goes further, folks. Paul Feinbaum came out and spoke out against Colin Kaepernick with a black man on air who agreed that black people are not being oppressed in America. His Sidekick agreed when Paul Feinbaum said that, but the next day, the next day, ESPN made Paul Feinbaum apologize in what was one of the most weak, disgusting, cowardly things I've ever seen Paul Feinbaum do, apologize for his true feelings and comments. That's disgusting. But it's just like the basketball player who, as soon as he found out was losing his paycheck, his protest stopped. I'm sure ESPN called up Mr. Feinbaum and said, hey, you better take that back or you're fired. That's millions of dollars on the table that he didn't want to lose. And of course, this is the same ESPN that prints out a story endorsing Colin Kaepernick. You cannot call Colin Kaepernick, but don't call him un-American. And here's what it comes down to for me at the end of the day. Again, I think that Colin Kaepernick trying to bring real issues to light is a good thing. I think him using his celebrity and the stage of the NFL is a good thing. I think athletes getting involved is a good thing. My problem is he's completely misinformed, and I'm curious if he knows who George Soros is, because this is very important, folks. When Black Lives Matter is being used to create, to create a divide between the cops 
and citizens or black and white people, this is not helping America. This is a George Soros operation. Now, we need to understand when George Soros is funding Black Lives Matter and funding civil arrest in this country, he's not doing it to help America. OK, what he's doing is trying to create a situation where he can reasonably bring about the federalization of police. This is a man who's been given millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter. This is the same man whose goal is to federalize America's police. So I got a question for you, Colin Kaepernick. If you think there's a problem with policing in, in America, do you really think that federalizing the police is gonna help? Do you really think that giving more power to a larger police system is gonna help? Of course it's not gonna help. So I invite Colin Kaepernick to Infowars.com to voice his opinion. Let's see him stand up and talk about real issues in America. It was 17 years ago, just north of Austin, Texas, in Waco, that I met John Ronson. And John was already a successful documentary filmmaker from BBC and also Channel 4. Uh, he had an idea. He was making a documentary on Waco, but he had an idea. He wanted to infiltrate Bohemian Grove uh, in Northern California and see if Republican leaders uh, were really involved in all these weird activities, a la Skull and Bones. But that's another story. Since then, he's written so many best-selling books, and one of them was The Psychopath Test, uh, that even many psychiatrists and psychologists say is a must-read and really made them rethink a lot of things, because he, he talks to a lot of experts. So I wanted to ask him today, in a brief interview for the Nightly News, what he thinks of the Atlantic Monthly and the Washington Post and Vanity Fair and everybody else basically doing assessments of Hillary Clinton, assessments uh, of Donald Trump from afar, and what he makes of that when he is the author of The Psychopath Test. So first, recap the book, break down what the body of thought is, not just from yourself, uh, but others. John Ronson, again, thanks for being here. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I wrote this book, The Psychopath Test, and as part of the research for the book, I went on a uh, course that taught me how to identify psychopaths. It was, and, and, and so I, I went on this course, and the guy who ran the course, who's like the father of modern psychopathy studies, a very kind of revered and respected man called uh, Robert Hare, um, said that one of his great regrets in life was that he spent all of his time researching prison psychopaths, when in fact what he should have been doing was researching corporate psychopaths. Um, because he said one, one of the most extraordinary things about the way that our world works is that you're four times more likely to have a psychopath at the top of the tree than at the bottom. That psychopathy is such a powerful brain anomaly, it remolds society all wrong. I think the assessment was that Donald Trump would try and do some things to appeal to the middle of the electorate, mm -hmm. to appeal to suburban college educated women. He's not. I mean, basically we have a psychopath running for president. So, when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton came along, obviously a huge number of mainstream outlets started saying, Trump's a psychopath, Hillary Clinton's a psychopath. Here's the test, look, you can just tell, look at this, look at that. Um, now, there's something called the, go I mean, I think it's terrible. I think, I, think, I think diagnosing people from afar as psychopaths is immoral. It's kind of psychopathic. When you see someone who you think has problems, you know it. But, but and there's not anybody at this table who doesn't think he has some sort of problem. Let's ask the questions. Let's do this at this point. But, but, you know, the DSM, their manual is, you know, it's like a brick. It's full of mental disorders, mental disorders everywhere. But they bought, they basically sent out a ruling saying psychiatrists don't do this. Don't diagnose Donald Trump from afar as a psychopath. And um, what they invoked was this thing called the Goldwater Rule. And the, basically, when Barry Goldwater was running for president, um, there was this famous paper where they interviewed like 3,000, or they sent out questionnaires to like 3,000 psychiatrists saying, is Barry Goldwater mentally fit for office? And about a thousand of them replied. A bunch of them replied and said, 
don't contact me again. But then like a thousand of them replied, said, you know, no, Barry Goldwater has, you know, mommy issues. Barry Goldwater is schizophrenic. Barry Goldwater is bipolar. And it was so unethical for these people to do that. And it, and it made the American psychiatric in industry look, look terrible, you know, because you can't just sort of declare somebody insane without having met, met them and evaluated them and sure. so on. Wait a minute. Yeah. Do you really think you, diagnosing people on air, and by, I assume you don't have a degree in psychi uh, psychology. Is that fair? I mean, it, like, well, we, we, we're jumping. We're jumping to conclusions here. I think this is what got, gets voters a little frustrated with well, this Well, you know, listen. Now, now we have, first, I so think first there's of all, an issue okay, here. Okay, okay. First of all, uh, a psychiatrist cannot come on and diagnose somebody. No, but we can uh, talk about the character traits that we are seeing repetitively here. We may try to figure that out. Uh, David Plubbs said psychopath. I think but, he misspoke. I think he meant sociopath. Sociopath. But I think, right. I think, there but is I, a difference. But I think it's very, we need to be very careful so, here. So the APA said, don't do this with Trump. But everyone's ignored it. And in fact, a, a thing came out just yesterday from an Oxford University professor saying, you know, Donald Trump is more of a psychopath than Adolf Hitler. For people who aren't psychopaths, um, people who do have empathy, uh, you know, behaving, um, behaving cruelly or psychopathically hurts because you feel remorse, you feel guilt, and those are like painful feelings. It's, it's a brain thing. You've got the amygdala, you've got the central nervous system. And the system. psychopaths think they're advanced because they don't feel it. Mm. The truth is they're crippled. Yes, exactly. John Ronson, it's been amazing talking to you. It was great to see you again. Alex, it was great to see you. So, Jonathan, you talk a little bit about in this film how China is setting itself up to compete with the United States. Uh, one of the things that you point out here is that China has observed U.S. actions um, as a superpower, so they've avoided getting involved in internal politics of the neighbors and trading partners, but a lot of countries prefer to do business with China. You also talk about these um, major institutions that are being set up by China, specifically the New Silk Road. Uh, the world's largest infrastructure and trade initiative. So talk a little bit about, about that. So in part one of the interview, I, I talked about the assassination of President Roldos in Ecuador. I think what's really instructive is, is that John Perkins, the, the author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman, who I interview in the film, uh, goes into detail about a meeting that he had with a very high-ranking Ecuadorian cabinet minister uh, just last year. And essentially, this cabinet minister told him that Ecuador would much prefer to do business with China because China doesn't get involved in the internal politics of any of the countries that they deal with. And what they do know about the United States is, is that, A, in the past that they have gotten involved in the internal politics. They have assassinated world leaders. They have been involved in, in, their, in countries around them. Uh, and maybe one day in the future, China will do these things. And I, I, would, I would make a pretty good argument that they will. But have they done it yet? And no, they haven't. So for many countries that just don't appreciate the meddling of the United States in their internal affairs, they would much prefer to deal with a country who doesn't have that track record. Um, so that's one point. I think the, the second point, there, there are really several different ways that China is trying to dismantle this current economic uh, system that was set up by the United States. Uh, one of them, one of the biggest ways is that they set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or the AIIB. And essentially, uh, of all the founding members, uh, nearly every single major U.S. ally participated in the founding of this bank. Uh, and all of them did it against the explicit wishes of the U.S. government, which, which is incredibly fascinating to begin with. That literally countries like, like the U.K. and other countries in Europe and such ignored U.S explicit U.S. warnings not to join this bank, and they did. Uh, and this bank is only gathering power. As a matter of fact, I'm coming to you from Canada. Uh, the Canadian government just announced just a few days ago that Canada will indeed be joining this bank as well. So what you're finding is, is that a lot of uh, U.S. allies are seeing the future, and they want to be part of that, obviously. So the AIB is ultimately going to be used to finance the world's largest infrastructure uh, project, uh, which is the new Silk Road. And they're going to be building ports and railways, highways throughout the basically connect the entire a massive super, supercontinent of Eurasia together. So it binds Africa, Asia and Europe together in this one integrated unit in terms of moving uh, goods around. 
And I think why this is so uh, dangerous for the United States, and there's universal agreement from everyone that I talk to in the film, is, is that this essentially gives countries an, alter an economic alternative moving forward. So they do not necessarily need to be part of this U.S.-led global economic system that we've enjoyed since 1945. They can indeed choose to, to choose to join this other, you know, parallel system that over time, I mean, this, I mean, Eurasia represents, you know, what is it, four fifths of the world's population. I mean, this, this is a this is a massive deal. So, you know, I, I don't know how much you want me to get into it. I can also get into the military aspects, which I think is is China is doing something very aggressive and unique in the South China Sea right now. Yeah, we definitely want to hear about that because a lot of people are seeing some aggressive maneuvers and. From where we sit, we don't really understand necessarily what's going on. Now, again, I'm speaking with Jonathan Roth, and we are talking about the documentary uh, that's just recently been released, China on Top, How China is Using America's Playbook to Take Over the World. And you can find that documentary at caseyresearch.com slash China. So, yes, let's talk about some of these military tactics that are happening. Sure. Well, essentially, a few years ago, China decided that they wanted to uh, push the U.S. out of the South China Sea. That it really, you know, China, let's, let's just be honest about this. China does not have a very powerful military. Uh, there's only one place in the world that they can really exert power and, inf and project power, and that's in the South China Sea. And they've decided they're going to do that because up until just recently, the South China Sea has essentially been, uh, you know, the Americans control it and they run it because so much trade runs that area. So they built up all these islands, which I'm sure many of your viewers have seen these stories uh, on television. But what's really behind this is, is that China is essentially trying to push the U.S. military out of this area because they recognize that the U.S. could choke off China in the event of any sort of conflict of, say, China between Japan or China and Taiwan. Uh, China, the U.S. Navy could cut off uh, trade in that area, which would literally cut China off from the rest of the world. And China just obviously can't abide by that. It would be similar to if, you know, if if the Russians had indeed uh, decided to take over the Gulf of Mexico, I, I don't think the Americans would have appreciated that in the 1950s and 60s. So that's that's what China has done. Now, I think the dangerous part for the United States over the long haul is, is that what this means, if, if the U.S. does not ultimately confront China on what's happening in the South China Sea, then every single U.S. ally, and this includes the Philippines, uh, well, Vietnam is, was moving to become an ally because of what's happening there, uh, Indonesia, but this, this extends further, this extends to Israel and to Europe and, and other places in the world, they're going to see that as the U.S. Uh, essentially moves out on their own and allows China to fill this vacuum, all these other countries are going to say to themselves, well, what, what, uh, you know, the Philippines has a security guarantee with the United States. If the U.S. will not stand up for the Philippines, will they stand up for us? And that's where this becomes extremely problematic, especially the, the most serious one is probably between China and, and Japan. If, if China makes a move on Japan, which is there are things happening there today, uh, if those things continue to escalate and China makes a move, uh, I mean, I, I, does, can Japan depend on the United States? Uh, if, if the U.S. moves out of the South China Sea, I, I would say that they probably won't. And I think if Hillary Clinton is elected president, I this is this is my own take on the situation. I would argue that he, I mean it, it's almost a guarantee that there is going to be a war in the South China Sea because the Chinese will not back down. And if Clinton is president, I don't think she will either. And I think you're going to have a very serious conflict that could escalate into something catastrophic very quickly. Absolutely, and I, I think we're all kind of. Um, just anticipating that there is going to be some sort of a World War III, but they're really ramping up the rhetoric that it's going to be uh, Russia is really the troublemaker there, but uh, China is really make, making these aggressive moves. Um, and as you say, they've kind of been planning this. I guess just briefly with our last question here, uh, what, what will we learn from the film about uh, China's role in the next financial crisis? Sure. I, I think this is, this is the element of the story that, that a lot of people don't really understand. Most most conventional analysts who study, the, you know, China and China's rise believe that China will not assume the number one role economically and geopolitically for at least another 20 to 30 years. I, I would make the argument, I make it in the film, that, that indeed that, that that's probably uh, the forecast may be too far out. And, and that is because the U.S. has a massive economic crisis that is just waiting, lurking around the corner uh, in terms of uh, something seriously terrible happening. Uh, and that really revolves around what happened in 2008. 2008, they papered over the crisis, central banks around the world, but the, being led and told by the Fed essentially what to do. 
uh, they, they essentially papered over this crisis and they have essentially built up this edifice that's even larger and more dangerous than it was in 2008. The banks are bigger than they've ever been before, the more complex. You're seeing many of the same activities that were happening in 2008, only to greater degrees. Uh, you know, they've, they've essentially lowered uh, interest rates to zero, and really they're below zero if you think about the rate of inflation versus what, uh, what interest rates are. So sooner or later, this crisis is going to hit the U.S. And when it does, I think what that's going to do is in many ways, similar to what happened in World War II with Great Britain, that really essentially, you know, utterly, you know, ended uh, British influence around the world and they had to divest of their empire. I think the same thing is going to happen in the United States. Uh, and the interesting part about it is, is that one out of every two Americans is invested in the stock market. In China, that number is only one in 30. So, you know, any sort of uh, long term exposure by Chinese citizens to this, you know, the global stock market is just not the same as what we have here. Uh, and when you take a look at savings rates in China versus what they are in the United States, there's a whole number of reasons to, to see why China will walk out of this situation in a lot better shape than the United States will. Now, of course, China has a lot of problems, a lot of there's no question about that. They have a lot of problems. But China has the one thing the U.S. doesn't have right now, and that's confidence. And if you ask any Chinese citizen, if you look at the Pew, the results from the Pew uh, research studies that they've been done, doing recently, I mean, China is full of confidence. Their citizens truly believe no matter what happens economically, even the short term, that they're going to be running the world. Wow. Americans do not feel that way. Yeah, no, we can definitely see that. Well, Jonathan Roth, thank you so much. And everyone go and watch the film, China on Top, How China is Using America's Playbook to Take Over the World. That is at caseyresearch.com slash China. Jonathan, thanks for joining us. We'll have you back on the show soon. Thank you very much. Intruder alert. If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance. These people are for everybody! A troubling report has surfaced involving Mexican immigration authorities. 424 North African migrants were given Mexican visas and are heading for the U.S.-Mexico border, where they plan on requesting asylum. The migrants arrived in the southern state of Chiapas over a two-day span last week. They were given transit visas. Mexican officials are calling the surge unusual, but say most migrants first travel through Brazil or Ecuador to start their journey through Latin America, heading for North America. Most of the Africans present themselves voluntarily to Mexican immigration officials, and what we do know is that Mexico's National Immigration Institute has issued them 20-day transit visas to allow them to migrate, reaching the U.S.-Mexican border where they can enter freely. We know that they're coming from the Congo, Somalia, and Ghana, and that they will arrive in the U.S. port entry of San Cisidro. The temporary visas allow entry, and oftentimes the migrant can assimilate freely without difficulty, unchecked, unvetted, and not monitored. Will this then set a precedent for thousands more to take advantage of our system? I'm Margaret Hal reporting for Infowars.com. Alex Jones here with huge breaking news. Hillary Clinton, in her own words, in FBI testimony released today, told the FBI that she had amnesia, didn't remember the emails, the servers, any of it. In her own words, she says she is unfit to be president. These things are predictable, but it's still hard to believe that the FBI has been pressured for months to release their research data dump on Hillary Clinton. Because even if they're going to roll over and not charge her for the crime she's publicly committed, they should at least release them. So now, with Labor Day coming up and having this holiday, on Friday, they predictably release the data dump at 1 p.m., Central Standard Time, knowing that Americans are busy going to pick their kids up after school and to get ready for the long three-day weekend. A lot of what's in the data dump we've already seen, but tons of it is new. We knew about 33,000 emails that she never turned over that disappeared. That was already admitted. Now they admit to 17,500 emails that they said weren't there that they previously denied to give over that were on the servers. 
So they basically gave the FBI this needle in a haystack and hoped they wouldn't notice that a lot of it was hiding in plain view. But here's the big news from the FBI, and it's on screen for TV viewers. Hillary Clinton over and over and over again dodged subpoenas, wouldn't testify to Congress, wouldn't talk to the FBI, wouldn't answer their questions. And it was even in the news at the time in 2013, where is she? She's in the hospital for almost a year. Well, now the FBI has gone public and said that Hillary Clinton told them years ago and then again recently that because she had a traumatic brain injury, a concussion, she had amnesia and didn't remember. This is so huge because this is what Matt Drudge for three years has been saying. It's what Obama's former doctor is saying. It's what Dr. Drew got fired for saying. It's what my guests like Dr. Steve Pachinik have been saying. Hillary Clinton clearly has neurological problems. Donald Trump comes out and says she's having to take naps all the time. She only gives a few speeches a week. She's low energy. This is not presidential material. WikiLeaks shows that she was trying to get drugs for Parkinson's. It goes on and on. The weird seizure-like behavior, the being helped up by Secret Service, uh, her doctor coming over with a tranquilizer pen saying, it's okay, it's okay, when somebody yells something in the crowd. This woman is clearly a basket case a lot of the time and is having serious problems. And the word is she had brain surgery multiple times during that year in the hospital that overlapped 2012, 2013. They've not released her full medical records. They've released only a snippet from an earlier doctor in New York. So this is such a big deal that Hillary Clinton, not, not Donald Trump, not Alex Jones, not Matt Drudge, not Breitbart, not World Net Daily, not Vladimir Putin, not the Keebler Elves, because we're all told this is a theory from Vladimir Putin and we're all getting orders. Hold on. Putin, what do I say? Okay, I'll say it right now. No, you look like hell. You've been in the hospital. You're falling down. You've got all these problems. You're in the hospital for a year. And now you, Hillary Clinton, told the FBI that you couldn't remember anything you did because you had such a serious brain injury. You need to be a, evaluated by an outside group of independent, nonpartisan brain surgeons, neurologists, and others, just as we've been calling for for six months. You need to actually debate Donald Trump and not just have back-to-back -back discussions with him like's coming up in the first meeting. And you need to be held accountable for being caught having classified material on your servers you lied about. The FBI's come out now and released the evidence. FBI's Hillary email probe found evidence of effort to evade federal records law. That's what made the head of the EPA have to step down three years ago, was having a fake set of records as well. You have absconded from the law, you've been caught, and it's time for the crime syndicate you represent, the Bush and Clinton crime family, to ride into the sunset. If you don't, it's pretty clear that your health's going to catch up with you, the law's going to catch up with you, and public opinion has already caught up with you. You've been caught red-handed. More stories and analysis at Infowars.com. If you're watching or listening to this transmission, you are the resistance. You know, Australia's a good example, Canada's a good example, the UK is a good example. Why? because each of them had mass killings. Somebody somewhere will comment and say, Obama politicized this issue. Well, this is something we should politicize. I'm not gonna carry a gun. I don't wanna be involved in a gun fight. If I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. Go ahead, make my day. So the notion that gun laws don't work is not borne out by the evidence. He says that the Chicago police had a plan over this bloody 4th of July weekend. Nonetheless, as you indicated, Corey, there was uh, a uh, count of casualties that could have been from Afghanistan or Iraq. We'll make it 
uh, harder for law-abiding citizens and criminals will still get their guns? In many cases, the offenders, uh, felons, uh, some out on parole, some out on bond. We have to respect the tradition in this country of people who want to defend themselves and their family from violence. There are people at high levels in this government who have bodyguards 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The average American does not have that. Mayor Bloomberg, why, why, why can you defend yourself but not the majority of Americans? I mean, look at, look at the team of security you got. Every day, every school, at every level. One thing that I think is clear with young people and with adults as well is that we just have to be repetitive about this. And we need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. Was this the weapon of choice for a new kind of terrorist? When a five-year-old girl said she and a classmate should shoot each other with bubbles, the school called it a terrorist threat. AK-47s belong in the hands of soldiers, not in the hands of criminals. You know, the right to bear arms is because that's the last form of defense against tyranny. Lay down your arms, you damn rebels! But we don't need the ability to arm ourselves against the army or the police. What kind of a situation in the U.S. would you well, see that happening? See, I mean, we've got a lot of constitutional lists and a lot of people that, that stockpile weapons. Discovered that clergy would help the government with potentially their biggest problem, us to say we're not turning our guns in and we're not running and we're not backing down if you want them come and take them rallying patriots worldwide in defense of human liberty it's alex jones Protesters. What's your name, ma'am? Hi, my name is Georgia Schmitz. And what are you out here protesting? I'm protesting Donald Trump. And what is it about Donald Trump that motivated you to come out here and protest? Well, I think he's sick and his running mate, Mike Pence, is a as well. He's a racist. I'm protesting because I think Donald Trump is a racist. Uh, I think he would be the worst president in the history of our country. I painted my face because I think that Trump is a joke. Because he is racist, misogynistic, he hates immigrants, and yet he has an immigrant as a wife. As I just said to her, let's look for something beyond an ad hominem attack. Let's talk about policy. Okay, he doesn't really have any, have any policy. Well, that's completely false, actually. Now, hold on. See, this is an amazing argument. I see people saying that Donald Trump has no policy. Donald Trump has given more detailed policy plans than any other candidate. Tax reform, health care, school. He's done it all. Immigration. No other candidate has had a detailed a detailed plan like this, but a joke. I, they continue to go to ad hominem attacks. So what else is wrong with Trump? I think Gigi Allen should be the president of the United States. I think we should all die. This is a protest. Hey, do you have anything to say? that immigration is a human right and that we should get rid of all borders. Now we've got some, uh, it looks like some communists gathered behind me. We're going to see what they're here doing. You guys are against Trump. You mind uh, telling us why? Uh, this guy doesn't, why can't you talk to him? Uh, you don't like his right to free speech? Trump. Uh, <laughs> that's why they don't want to talk to us because that's all they can say. See, see? Every single one of them, every single one of them has used that. Why are you trying to fight me, bro? Hey, hey, what are you saying? What are you guys chanting? What does that mean? Anti-capitalist. You're anti-capitalism. So why don't you go to a communist country? You have Nike. Oh, we're trying to make this one a communist country. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, do you know about Venezuela? Never heard of it. Never heard of Venezuela. Venezuela is a communist country that is collapsing. They're eating their pets. They're so hungry. What do you think about that? Fucking idiot. You want to know communism if it punch you in the face? What do you think about Venezuela? Like it did Alex Jones last year. What do you think about Venezuela? Alex Jones, what happened last year? What do you... Hey, hey, hey. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about Venezuela? I think you're a boy and you don't know what communism means. How do y'all say stop the hate? What do you... We've got, uh, they want Alex 
Jones out of Austin. They want Infowars out of Austin. These people hate free speech. They're obviously communists. So I don't know why they just don't go to Venezuela, a communist haven. Hey, you guys know North Korea is communist too. Why don't you go to North Korea? You. Can you put your sign down? You're out here for, I don't understand people that, I'm, I'm not in your face, calm down. I just don't understand people that come out here and protest and then, oh, look at that. I just became an official Hillary Clinton supporter. Senior citizens, look at Donald Trump is a filthy, lying... I don't think you speak for all Man. senior citizens. Are you out of your mind? My grandparents mind? support Donald I Trump. I don't give a about your grandparents. That's clearly. What I know about are the people that I know. I'm a senior citizen, and I don't believe in dirty, filthy, lying politics. Okay, so who are you going to vote for? Can I ask you who you're going to vote for? You can count on it. I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. Hold on, folks. She just said she's against lying, corrupt politicians, but she's voting for Hillary Clinton. You would think if you're out here protesting, there is something driving you to do that. There's a motivational factor. And then when I give them a platform to talk about their issues, they complain. Completely ignore me. I get blown. I'm a, this is a clown. This guy, yeah, I do actually. Or do you have a clown degree? Did you go to clown school? I do. Wait, hey, it's official. So are you clowns against Trump? Yeah, yeah, we are. We hate free speech, so we're out here protesting. Well, you don't want Alex Jones' right to free speech. I don't even know who the f Alex Jones. You were just chanting Alex Jones out of Austin. Yeah, I know what I was saying. I'm not stupid. So you say things you know nothing about? Yeah. That's so like communism? Well, I'm Russian. I know plenty about that. So you should know why communism is bad. Yeah, I do know why communism is So why are you out here protesting capitalism? Why are you out here interrogating me? The reason why we come out here and do these videos is because these people embarrass themselves. People go watch these videos and then they see how stupid the anti-Trump movement is. That's the truth. That's why we do these videos you think i want to be out here in the 95 degree heat sweating like this no but we come out here and we destroy the anti-trump movement because these people are the most ignorant people i've ever met in my life owen schroyer for infowars.com stupid questions intelligent answers donald trump is a tramp we are still uh, probably at least a quarter of a mile away from the trump rally and traffic is backing up it's a near standstill people have Sorry to get out of their cars and walk. I am inviting anyone here. The microphone. Come tell me why you hate Trump. Shut the up. Because I have a vagina. Because Trump ain't for the people. He's racist, nigga. Because he's a piece of shit. What's your point, ma'am? What's your point, ma'am? What's your point, ma'am? What's your point, cowbell? Can I ask who you support for president in the upcoming election? Hillary Clinton. You don't think Hillary Clinton lies? Well, you know what? She has more experience than Trump does. And what experience is that? This is what a pro-Trump uh, TV state. Oh, is it? Yeah, oh, well, then really go. So what? So you're bigoted against me? I'm not bigoted. Oh, well, then why did you come say that to cut her off? Because you're a pro-Trumper. Okay, you're probably a pro-Hillarier. You're a pro-Trumper. You're really educated. Go ahead, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, so there we go. Thank you for your time, though. Woo! Great response, great response. So, look at this guy. Somebody stuck a knife in this guy's tire at the Trump rally. Right outside of Trump rally. You want to say something? Well, we've seen uh, cases of Trump supporters getting their tires slashed, getting beat up and everything. And that's, that's all we can assume that happened right here. I don't know why else a pocket knife would be sticking out of a tire, so... Unfortunately uh, for this person, he was victimized by the peaceful Trump protesters this evening. They said in October I'd be dead in six months. It's also what happens when you listen to the radio host, Alex Jones who claims that 9-11 and the Oklahoma City bombings were inside jobs. He even said, and this really just is so disgusting, he even said the victims of the Sandy Hook massacre were child actors and no one was actually killed there. I don't know what happens in somebody's mind or how dark their heart must be to say things like that. 
But Trump doesn't challenge these lies. He actually went on Jones's show and said, your reputation is amazing. I will not let you down.